Assalamu alaikum. So in this lecture, what we will do is we will talk about a number of basic techniques or applications. We'll talk about electrophoresis. We'll talk about the concepts of denaturation and hybridization. And these two concepts would allow us to move on and talk about more techniques. So let's start. The main resource is the lecture itself, by the way. So I'm going to talk about uh, th the, these concepts in details, and you will not find these details in textbooks like Cooper's. Now, you can go back to Cooper's, uh, these pages, um, in chapter four, and, and but they're not detailed enough, okay? So pay attention to the concepts that I will cover in this lecture. Now, before I start talking about the first technique, uh, let me differentiate between uh, two terms, DNA labeling versus DNA staining. So the idea here is that we really cannot see DNA with our own eyes because it absorbs light at, at the, in the UV range and we cannot see UV light. So we have to do something so that we can see it. And we can either see it by staining it or coloring it or by labeling it, which means that it emits a signal. Okay, it produces a signal. Now, staining basically um, is coloring DNA. So the idea is that we take DNA and we add something to it like ethidium bromide. Now, this is ethidium bromide. And this ethidium bromide um, has a flat structure and it can intercalate, it gets between the base pairs, okay? And it gives a color, a color that we can see. Okay, so DNA labeling on the other hand, which is more sensitive by the way, and it is used to see uh, minute amounts of DNA, is basically we stick to DNA something that emits a signal. Just have, just like having this hard hat um, uh, worker having a hard ha wearing a hard hat with a light stuck on it. So it's not the person that is emitting the light. It's actually something that is uh, stuck to it, that is part of it, that becomes part of it. So what we do is that we can take DNA and we can label it either with, for example, radioactive phosphorus. So the phosphorus itself emits a signal that can be detected, okay? Or we can attach a fluorescent tag to the DNA so that it's not really the DNA that emits the signal, it's rather uh, the fluorescent tag itself, okay? So labeling versus staining. Now we use labeling to detect small amounts of DNA and we use staining to detect large amounts of DNA. Now, so let's talk about the first technique. It's called gel electrophoresis. So what does phoresis mean? It means movement, okay? Movement of molecules like DNA, electro, means an electrical field. So it's movement of DNA through an electrical field or by an electrical field. Gel, basically, it's like a, a jello, the jello that we eat um, uh, in parties, the jello that we love to eat. Same idea. See, the, the thing is, if you, let's say, if you put a drop of water on the top of a jello, this water would disappear. Where would, where, would, where would it go? It would go through the pores of the jello. Same thing with this gel that we use to uh, analyze DNA. It's prepared from a sugar molecule known as agarose. Okay? And this agarose, just like exactly like a jello, uh, we dissolve it in water and then we heat it so that when it cools down, it polymerizes. So it forms something like this. This is a scanning electron image of an agarose gel. 
so you can see the pores, the holes, the openings within the gel itself. So the DNA would move through these pores, okay? And the idea here is that smaller DNA fragments, smaller DNA pieces having a few nucleotides within that, uh, that make up this DNA would move faster through the gel versus large DNA fragments. The DNA fragments, as they move, they would keep on hitting the solid structure of the gel. So they would move slower than the smaller DNA fragments. Now the thing is, the larger DNA fragments are, the slower they move through the gel. So when we prepare a gel, we create openings uh, within or inside the gel itself. These are known as wells. So they really look like wells. So here you have a well right here. Okay. So we add our sample uh, in the well, just like in here. So right here we have a, a gel having one, two, three, four, five wells. We add our samples inside these wells. So we add sample one here, sample two here, sample three here, and so on. Okay, uh, just like as you can see in, in, in this picture right there. So the thing is, then what we do is that we place the gel in a tank and this tank contains a solution. And we apply an electrical field. So we have a cathode, the negative end, and the anode, the positive end of the gel, of the uh, of the um, uh, the tank within the tank. So when we apply an electrical field, now DNA would move from the cathode towards the anode. Question is, why would it do that? Because it is negatively charged, and why is it negatively charged? Because of the phosphate groups. Okay, so the DNA would move from the cathode to the anode. Remember, the larger the DNA fragment is, the slower it will move. So we place, let's say, sample one here and sample two right here. And let's apply electrical field in here. Again, DNA fragments would move from the cathode to the anode, the smaller DNA fragments would move faster than the larger DNA fragments. Okay. Same idea. We place our sample in here. Okay. We apply an electrical field. And you have movement of smaller DNA fragments faster than larger DNA fragments. Now, DNA doesn't have any color, so how can we see it? We stain it, okay, by ethidium bromide. So we add ethidium bromide. Ethidium bromide would bind to DNA, would get into the DNA molecules, and DNA molecules now have a color. Now, the thing is, DNA fragments move in the form of bands. So we call them bands. Okay, and the shape of the band really looks like the shape of the well. So the, the narrower the well is, the narrower the DNA band would be. Okay, same idea. Now, each band, this is a very important point in here. Each band does not contain one DNA molecule. We cannot see one DNA molecule even if we stain it with ethene bromide. Each band contains thousands to millions of DNA fragments. Now these DNA fragments have the same size because they move at the same speed. So they move as one band. So within each band, we have thousands to millions of DNA fragments. Now these DNA fragments can be of the same type or different types. 
meaning that that these DNA fragments can have the same exact sequence they are identical of each other or they can be different different sequences but they have only one thing in common and that is they have the same size and that's why they move together in one band okay so how can we determine the size of the DNA fragments that we see that we have in our sample see here you have sample one and sample two let's say from two different individuals we use a size standard meaning that it's a sample that contains DNA fragments of known sizes or known length so right here and so we purchase uh, by the way we, we purchase the the size standard sample or we can prepare it in our labs so we have here a size standard containing DNA fragments having different lengths we have thousand base pair DNA fragments we have 850 750 600 200 and 100 base pair DNA fragments now remember each band contains thousands to millions of uh, copies of DNA fragments okay and when you say 100 base pair it means it's a DNA that contains 2,000 bases and they are paired together okay so we have 1,000 on one strand and we have 1,000 on the other strand okay and that's how the DNA fragments travel okay so the smaller the DNA fragment the faster they move through the gel from the cathode to the anode so we have sample one right here having a DNA band or a band that travels at the same speed as a thousand base pair DNA fragment so we can say that sample one contains a DNA fragment that has a or, a, or DNA molecule or whatever having a size of 1000 base pair same thing with sample number two now sample one also contains another DNA fragment it's a different different DNA molecule having a size of 850 base pair sample two does not have that so the two samples are different from each other now how about the size of this DNA fragment how about the size of this DNA fragment well let's see this DNA fragment right here travels at the same speed as the DNA fragment of 750 base pair. So we can say that the size of, or the length of this DNA fragment is about 750 base pair. How about this one? There's nothing that travels along with it. Well, we can estimate what the size of this DNA fragment is. So you look here, and you say aha it travels between 750 and 600 base pair DNA fragments okay but it travels maybe closer to the 750 so we can estimate its size to be around 700 base pair same thing with this DNA fragment right here okay Now I encourage you to visit this website and see an animation of gel electrophoresis. Uh, I also encourage you to open the YouTube and it, it's an excellent resource for many things uh, in life, including molecular biology. So just type in agrogel electrophoresis DNA and watch the different videos and different animation videos, but don't waste your time with long videos. Okay, just watch the shorter ones but you can visit this website okay so dna does not absorb light um, in uh, in the range that we see okay <clears throat> it absorbs light at eight at 260 nanometers which is in the uv range something that we cannot see why is it that dna can absorb light in the uv range because of the aromatic rings of pyrimidines and purines the ring structures usually absorb light at different wavelengths for in, in case of pyrimidines and purines the light that is absorbed is in the uv range at 260 nanometers 
And it just happens that double-stranded DNA can absorb light uh, at a certain uh, amount, certain units of light can be absorbed by double-stranded DNA uh, according to the amount of DNA. And we know that if a DNA sample absorbs one unit of light, it means that the amount of DNA in the sample is about 50 micrograms per mil. In other words, if I have a DNA sample that has a concentration of DNA of about 50 micrograms per mil, it would be able to absorb one unit of light. Okay, now, question is, what if you have a DNA sample that contains a concentration of 5 micrograms per mil? How much light would be absorbed? It should absorb one-tenth of it, meaning that it would absorb 0 0.1 unit of light. What if you have a DNA sample that can absorb 0 0.5 unit of light? What is the concentration of the of this DNA sample? Well, crisscross, meaning that if 50 can absorb one unit of light, then 0 0.5 means that the concentration is 25 micrograms per mil. Okay. <clears throat> so here's a problem right here. What is the concentration of a double-stranded DNA sample diluted? Aha, we have something new in here diluted at 1 to 10 and absorbance is about 0 0.1 question is what is the concentration of the diluted sample well if the amount of light is 0 0.1 unit it means that the concentration is 5 micrograms per mil okay great now the question is <coughs> excuse me what is the concentration of the original, the undiluted DNA sample? Well, you have to consider this dilution, the 1 to 10. So you need to multiply the concentration that you got by 10. So now the concentration of the original DNA sample is 50 micrograms per mil. So it's 0 0.1 times 10 times 50, and that would be equal to 50 micrograms per mil. <clears throat> okay, something else. We have also observed that single stranded DNA can absorb more light than double stranded DNA. Why? Because in the double stranded DNA, uh, the, the bases are stacked and they are embedded they are hidden inside the double stranded dna on the other hand the bases in the single stranded dna are more exposed so they can absorb more light okay so it just happens that less double less less dna if it is single stranded can absorb um, the same amount of light as more double-stranded DNA. Okay? Okay. Let me explain it again. Single-stranded DNA can absorb, if, if it has a concentration of 30 micrograms per, of, per mil, it can absorb one unit of light. You need more double-stranded DNA, you need 50 micrograms per mil to absorb the same amount of light. Okay, so this means that single-stranded DNA absorbs more light than double-stranded DNA. Now, if I have the same concentration of DNA, look at this uh, graph right here. If I have this, uh, if I have the same concentration of DNA at 200 uh, single-stranded and double-stranded DNA at 260 nanometers, single-stranded DNA would absorb more light. So that's absorbance, the amount of light that is absorbed. There's more absorbance of light by single-stranded DNA than double-stranded DNA. So I can give you a problem 
um, a of either single-stranded DNA or double-stranded DNA, and you have to use the same um, uh, method shown in here of calculation. Pay attention to the dilution as well. Okay, so you can exercise using different um, uh, different numbers and, and, and different forms of questions. Okay. So there are um, two concepts or two terms that we need to know. The first is known as uh, DNA denaturation, and the other is known as uh, renaturation. And uh, denaturation is basically, they, they are the opposite of each other. So denaturation is basically when the two strands are separated from each other, and this can be done by heat. Okay, so what happens is that if uh, at increasing temperature, the hydrogen bonds between the bases would be broken up, separating the two strands from each other. Now, renaturation is the opposite. So if we cool down the, the environment or the atmosphere around um, uh, DNA, the two strands would renature to each other. They would reform the hydrogen bonds. So as long as the, the sequences, the nucleotides, are complementary to each other, you will have the DNA coming back together, forming double-stranded structure. Okay, so that's denaturation and renaturation. Now there is another term for renaturation, and it's known as hybridization. Hybridization is basically renaturation, or sorry, it's reforming double-stranded DNA, except that the two strands come from different sources. So let's say, for example, we have uh, three samples, sample one, two, and three, and they're different from each other. They, they come from different sources. We can separate the two strands from each other by increasing the temperature, for example, and you can have the formation of a hybrid, a hybrid, okay? So you have two strands right here, from two different sources, but they form perfect uh, uh, annealing, okay, or perfect binding, because they are 100% complementary to each other. And um, you can have the formation of another hybrid, except that in this case, it is not perfect. It is imperfect hybridization. So you have uh, uh, hydrogen bond bonds formed between these bases right here, but these spaces are not complementary to each other, and that's why they do not form hydrogen bonds. But as long as you have enough hydrogen bonds between the two strands, you can have the formation of double-stranded DNA, except that it is not perfect. One factor that causes DNA to be denatured is temperature. So what happens is that as you increase the temperature, the hydrogen bonds between the bases get broken up and the two strands get separated from each other. Okay, so right here, for example, you have double-stranded DNA at low temperature. So the, the DNA is double-stranded. As you start to increase the temperature, the DNA the two strands get separated slowly from each other. So the, the hydrogen bases, the hydrogen interactions, I'm sorry, between the bases um, get broken up. Eventually, at very high temperatures, the DNA would be all single-stranded. If we decrease the temperature, the DNA would renature, right? Uh, the DNA would form double-stranded DNA. Again, the two strands would be complementary to each other. Now, this denaturation process is very slow, by the way. Okay, So it gets to a certain point uh, where 50% of the DNA molecule is single-stranded and 50% is double-stranded. This point right here is called the melting temperature. 
okay? And this point is quite important because it can differ between different DNA fragments according to certain factors. But before we talk about these factors, I want you to pay attention to the y-axis in here. This is the amount of light that is absorbed. Notice that it gets higher. Why? Because the DNA becomes more single-stranded, right? So single-stranded DNA, even if, if we're talking about the same concentration of DNA, single-stranded DNA absorbs more light than double-stranded DNA. DNA. And the difference is 1 to almost 1.4, which is the difference between uh, 30 uh, micrograms per mil versus 50 micrograms per mil. Okay, so what are the factors that affect, that influence the value of the melting temperature? Or what are the factors that influence um, how DNA is, is uh, denatured? Well, there are a number of factors. One is the length of the DNA fragment. The larger the DNA fragment, the higher the temperature that is needed to denature DNA, totally. In other words, the, the longer the DNA fragment is, the higher the melting temperature is, the higher the, the temperature where DNA is 50-50, 50, 50, 50 double-stranded, 50 single-stranded is. Why? Because you have more bases, meaning that you have more hydrogen bonds. So you need more energy to denature the DNA strands from each other. So that's one factor. Another factor is GC pairs. The higher the GC content is of a DNA fragment, the higher the melting temperature and the higher the temperature uh, that is needed to denature the DNA fragment in full. Okay? It makes sense again. Why? Because there are three hydrogen bonds between Gs and Cs and two hydrogen bonds only for A's and T's. So if you have two DNA fragments of the same length, but you have one having more GC content than the other one, uh, the one with the higher GC content would need more energy, more temperature, higher temperature to denature the DNA versus the other one. Okay, as you can see here in, in these two DNA fragments, um, the melting temperature is higher for the one having more GC content than the other one. Now, there are other factors like pH, extreme pH, whether we're talking about uh, low pH or high pH, um, uh, would also influence the melting temperature. Uh, salts and ions. Mm -hmm. Think about it. What is the influence of high salt concentration on DNA denaturation. Would higher salt concentration increase the melting temperature or decrease the melting temperature? Think about it. Now, salts and ions, if we're talking about, let's say, possibly charged ions like sodium ions, what would they do? They would mask the negative charges of the phosphate groups, right? Meaning that they stabilize the DNA. Meaning that higher energy, higher temperature is needed to denature DNA at higher salt concentration. There are other factors like destabilizing factors like alkaline solutions, formamid, urea, um, formamid and urea specifically break hydrogen bonds. So if you add urea to your sample, you should look, the, the temperature that is needed to denature DNA should be lower. So the melting temperature would also be lower as well. 
So let's talk about the concept of hybridization. The thing is, hybrid means formation of something from two different sources. Okay. So if I say DNA hybridization, it means that I'm forming double-stranded DNA where each strand comes from a different source. Okay. So, for example, right here, I can have two DNA fragments uh, coming from two different sources. Okay. So we have sample one. Let's say um, uh, DNA from uh, individual A, sample two. DNA from individual B. If we denature the double-stranded DNA and mix the mix DNA from sample one and sample two, there is a good chance that you would have DNA strands, uh, double-stranded DNA, whereby each strand comes from a different individual. Now this means that this DNA is a hybrid DNA. Now, what does determine if two strands can de de uh, renature and hybridize to each other? Complementary base pairing. As long as the bases are complementary to each other, as long as the DNA strands are complementary to each other, they can form a DNA hybrid. Okay, so you would actually have different forms of double-stranded DNA. You can have the original, the uh, blue and red, as you can see here, or you can have a hybrid, as you can see here. Again, the rule is, as long as they are complementary to each other, they can form a hybrid. Okay, well, what if you take, let's say, um, human DNA and monkey DNA? Can they hybridize to each other? And the answer is yes. As long as they're complementary to each other, they can hybridize to each other. So you can have even uh, uh, a hybrid between DNA, uh, between human DNA and bacterial DNA. It doesn't matter what the source of DNA is. What matters is if they are complementary to each other, then they can hybridize to each other. Okay. Well, does hybridization or does base pairing need to be perfect? And the answer is no, it doesn't have to be perfect. As long as you can have enough hydrogen bonding and enough base pairing, you can have hybridization between the DNA fragments. And you can have regions where you would have imperfect base pairing as you can see in here. Okay, so right here you do have a perfect base pairing and here you have imperfect base pairing. But there are enough hydrogen bonds between the two strands that these two strands can form a DNA hybrid. So what does influence if if you can have uh, a, uh, if you can have imperfect base pairing or not? What does influence hybridization? Well, it's all of the other previous factors with, that we just talked about: temperature, salt concentration, and so on. So if you mix the two DNA uh, uh, samples at high temperature there is a low chance that you would have imperfect hybridization because there is a good chance that at high temperature the hydrogen base pairing would not form uh, to, to, uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, um, at a, a large degree that would allow hybridization to take place. So in order to allow for imperfect base pairing to take place, we can mix the, the uh, different DNA samples at low temperature. Something else is salt concentration. If we increase salt concentration, that would reduce the repulsion between the phosphates, and that would allow for imperfect hybridization to take place. Now, if you lower 
salt concentration, there is a good chance that we keep only perfect hybridization in our uh, sample and, and we prevent, we block the formation of imperfect base pairing. Now, I would like to emphasize this point further. That is, hybridization can be non-specific. So you can have the formation of double-stranded DNA between a short piece, between a short piece of DNA and a long piece of DNA. Okay, and this hybridization can be perfect or it can be imperfect. But as long as, again, you have enough hydrogen bonds formed between the two strands, that's fine. You can have the formation of double-stranded DNA or partially double-stranded DNA. Now, this can be done by controlling the temperature, controlling the ionic strength, controlling uh, the GC content, and so on. Okay, so if we have enough Gs and Cs, having three hydrogen bonds, you can have the formation of good, uh, stable, double-stranded DNA, or this good uh, hybridization between the two. But if you have all uh, As and Ts um, with, with uh, low ionic strength, uh, little ions, high temperature in the solution, well, that would not uh, um, promote the formation of hybridization. So basically, you can have, let's say, a, a, um, a DNA that comes from uh, uh, mice and DNA that comes from a human cell. Well, there is some complementarity between the two. Okay? So you can have the formation of hybridization. Uh, between the two DNA molecules, between the human DNA and the mouse DNA, but you do not expect it to be perfect hybridization.